Hallelujah, Jesus. Come on, let's just sing it to the Lord one more time. God, your presence is an open door. And we want you, Lord, like an air. Lift your voice in this room and sing it out. Your presence is an open door. So come now. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we worship you in this place, God, this morning. God, your presence, Lord God, is what we need today. God, it's what we desire, Lord God, in this house this morning. So we pray, Lord, fill the room today, Jesus. Fill our hearts, God, fill our lives, God. We come in, Lord, in one mind, in one accord. God, just like that day of Pentecost, God, pour your presence out. God, this place once again.
Spirit, baby. 
He said, I must go away so that I can send one greater. And then it's, it's Pentecost Sunday. So in Acts chapter 2, it said, on the day of Pentecost, they were all gathered together in one accord. And then the Holy Spirit showed up. So they were praying together. And they saw tongues of fire. And it says in verse 4 of Acts chapter 2, it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And I don't know about you, but I don't know of a better prayer to pray on Pentecost Sunday than, Lord, pour out your Spirit fresh on me. Pour out your Spirit anew in me. God, I need a fresh filling. I need a fresh anointing. God, I need what they experience in the Acts 2 church, God. I need you to pour your spirit out to make me more like Jesus. I need your spirit, God, to walk through hard times. I need more of your spirit to be filled with power and might and to walk in all authority that you have bestowed upon us. I need more of your spirit, oh God. God, I pray that today for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit. God, work in us today. Move in us today. God, we give you praise on a Pentecost Sunday for the blessing and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you, Lord. And we give you praise and honor today. And the church said, amen and amen. Would you give God praise this morning? Amen and amen. You can be seated this morning. Man, it's a great day at Generations Church. I don't know if you noticed it when you walked in. There was just something some, there was a buzz out there in the foyer today. There was some things happening. It is a grad Sunday. We've got baptisms. It's Pentecost Sunday. Man, it is a great day here at Generation Church, and we are excited to celebrate with you. If you're a guest with us today, we welcome you. Uh, maybe you're here uh, honoring one of our graduates or honoring one of our uh, baptism candidates. Man, we just welcome you today. You are uh, it is a joy to have you here, and you are family just by walking in the door today, and we welcome you. Would you welcome our guests with a round of applause today? 
If you're a guest with us or maybe a returning guest, maybe it's your second or third time, there's going to be a video that comes up right after me uh, that has some details on our Connect card that's sitting in front of you in the seat pocket. It's just that. It's our chance to connect with you, your chance to connect with us. And, man, we would just love to follow up with you after today and just, uh, just welcome you again to the Generations Church family and answer any questions that you might have. And uh, man, we are celebrating today. There are so many great things happening at Generations Church, not just today, but over the course of the next, uh, well, I guess it's almost summer now. We're hitting graduation. It's almost summer, and we've got a lot of things happening around here. So check out these video announcements and see all that's happening. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Michaela Droz, and here's a look at what's happening around Generations Church. We want to welcome all of you who are watching and attending our service today. If you are a first time or returning guest, we are so glad you are here. At Generations Church, we believe in community and friendship and would love to connect with you. If this is your first time with us, check out our Connect card or the Connect QR code located in the seat pocket in front of you. You can fill out the contact section and return it to our guest services desk in the foyer. We have a gift bag, including a Chick-fil-A gift card to say thank you for being our guest today. If this is your second or third visit, we ask that you complete a Connect card as well. Just write your name and check the returning guest box and return to the guest services desk or put it in the drop box in the foyer. For everyone, we have a prayer section on the Connect card and invite you to share a prayer request with our pastors. We also have a response section on our Connect card. If you would like to be baptized, become a member, join a Connect group, or join a serve team, you can fill it out and return to guest services desk. Good morning, Generations Church. I want to read a promise from Scripture concerning your giving. Hebrews 6 says, God will not forget your work and the love that you have shown Him as you've helped His people and continue to help them. God knows when you give to help others. He knows when it's done out of abundance, and He knows when it's done out of sacrifice. His promise is that He will remember you and will respond at the appropriate time by helping you and blessing you. We have many ways in which you can worship this morning by giving. If you're here with us in person, the ushers are here to serve you, or you can use the drop box in the foyer. You can give online at our website and set up recurring giving at gctlh.org or on our Generations Church app on your phone or by scanning the give QR code on the seat back in front of you or in the foyer. If you're new to our church, we're so glad that you're here. Please do not feel obligated to give in any way. You are our guest and we're glad to have you. Again, I want to say thanks for your faithfulness, your heart for the Lord and for others. Thank you, Generations Church, and God bless you. May is National Foster Care Month. We want to take a moment to thank foster parents and those who support foster care for the incredible and selfless work you do every day. We believe it is the church's role to care for the fatherless and our GC Families Ministry is our response to the foster care crisis in our community. We would love to have you join us in support by praying for the foster community, partnering with us by joining our team, or donating to our Placement Packages initiative, or becoming a foster parent yourself. For more information on getting involved, you can speak to our ministry lead, Melissa Dansell, or visit our website at gctlh.org. GC Ladies will be meeting for a seven-week virtual summer Bible study beginning June 6th on Thursday evenings at 8 o'clock p.m. Find Your People Video Bible Study by author Jenny Allen offers practical solutions for creating true community in a world that is more connected and more isolated than ever before. Sign up at gctlh.org or contact Becky Nugent at becky at gctlh.org for more information. Join us on Wednesday, May 22nd as we celebrate the accomplishments of our GC boys, GC girls, and junior Bible quiz team. Join us in the sanctuary for worship and help us honor the achievements of all our GC kids. All parents, grandparents, family, and friends are invited to attend. Registration for Mega Sports Camp Plus is live. Mega Sports Camp Plus is our traditional Mega Sports Camp plus a few new non-sport activity groups, cooking and crafts. This year's camp will be held on July 22nd through 26th from 9 a.m. to noon each day with drop-off beginning at 8.30 a.m. The camp is for children ages 5 to 11, grades kindergarten to 5th. Registration is now open. 
There's a $20 fee that covers all supplies and snacks for the week. You can register your child today on our website events page. For more information regarding Generations Church, its ministries, events, or other serving opportunities, feel free to visit our guest services desk in the foyer, follow us on social media, download our app, or visit our website at gctlh.org. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. You can go ahead and play that. If I could have all the graduates come join me up front. So it's a special day here as we honor uh, the seven graduates of the class of 2024. So graduations are always very special. Uh, but I, th I think that they're a little more special in the context of church. Because... At school graduations, we're marking academic success. But as we honor graduates, we're marking a transition of season that God has for them as we propel them from student to adult. And so today is special for us. You see, over the next few months, now that high school has come to an end, we'll see many of them endeavor out on their own for the first time in their lives. They'll enter into college or trade school or work for the first time responsible for their own decisions, outcomes, and yes, students, your own finances. Let me say this first. Parents, well done. Well done. This is a special group of students that you see before you. It's not often that we get to honor this many graduates. And so I just want to say, you hear it often that the Bible says to raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. That is my prayer over each one of your students today, that you have done the work to raise them in the way that they should go. And students, your responsibility is to never depart from it. So the group that stands before you today is special. I believe there's great plans and purposes represented in front of you. You see, this group was the group that was going from fifth grade into sixth grade youth when Melissa and I got here some eight years ago. Now, we weren't coming on as youth pastors. We were just going through a little ministry transition. And But man, this class right here has left an impression on us that other classes are going to have a lot to live up to. You see, yes, we just came on as youth pastors a little bit ago. But I've seen God move in each of their lives in powerful ways, and I believe that God's hand is on each one of them. So I'm going to introduce each student to you, and we have a gift from our church for each of you, and then Pastor Brian's going to come with a few words. The first is Gavin Bush, son of Jeffrey and Jessica Stowell, graduating from North Florida Christian School. 
Gavin won the Christian Character Award. He is a member of the National Society of High School Scholars. He's an honor roll student, defensive scout team player of the year, highest academic achievement award during his junior year, represented North Florida Christian School in the state facts competition where he received a superior ribbon for his short sermon. Gavin plans to become a paramedic, a firefighter, and a SWAT medic, and I'm not really sure how he's gonna pull off all three. But let me say, if there's anybody that can do it, it's that young man right there. Gavin's greatest memories at Generations Church are going on missions trips, developing lasting friendships, and building a closer relationship with God. Chase Garrison, son of Jason and Emily Garrison, graduating from Florida State University School. Chase graduated with honors as an honor roll student. He is the recipient of the Buddy Martin Athletic Scholarship and is also a leader in Florida High's FCA. Chase plans to attend the TCC to FSU program studying athletic training, and his greatest memories at Generations Church were the 2022 Forward Conference trip and getting baptized as a child. Gabrielle Alexis Gilbert. Your parents did that. You're welcome. Daughter of Brad and Becca Gilbert, uh, graduating from Lincoln High School. Alexis is graduating summa cum laude, or loud, I don't know, I, I'm a youth pastor. Member of National Honor Society. Alexis plans to attend Florida State University School beginning this summer, and her greatest memories at Generations Church were watching the kids that she watched in the toddler room grow and develop. Matthew Kunkel, son of Brian and Stacy Kunkel. Matthew's graduating from Godby High School and plans to begin trade school after graduation. Matthew's greatest memories at Generations Church are some of the memories he made while in Children's Church. Roger William Nemeth Jr., son of Roger Sr. and Rebecca Nemeth. Uh, Roger is one of our homeschool graduates uh, who wanted me to make sure that you knew he was valedictorian of his class. <laughs> Roger plans to attend TCC part-time while also attaining his enrolled agent certification so that he can begin working with his father at his company, Tax Help Software. Roger's greatest memory at Generations Church is when he was baptized this past year. William Colin Nestor, son of Brad and Lee Nestor, graduating from Leon High School, graduating summa cum laude, National Merit Scholarship finalist, and recipient of the Benequisto Scholarship. Colin plans to attend Florida State University to study engineering, and Colin's greatest memories at Generations Church were participating in junior Bible quiz competitions. And then finally, we have one graduate who has already graduated and moved to Central Florida, so she's not here, uh, but we wanted to be sure to honor her. That's Kaylee Williams, daughter, go ahead. <laughs> That's the daughter of Christian and Tiffany Williams. Uh, she is also one of our homeschool graduates who plans to attend Florida State University to study political science with a minor in philosophy on a pre-law track. Kaylee's greatest memories at Generations Church were the, were the Christmas plays that she was in as a child. Would you give it up for one more time for our class of 2024? Amen. Guys... If you can slide over in the middle, turn around and face me for a moment. I have just a few words that I want to uh, share with you guys um, on this great milestone day of uh, your, your life, this opportunity. So you've had your families and schools that have celebrated you. And now we as your church family, we want to come and celebrate you. We are very proud 
of you. We've known you guys for a long time, so it is with great joy that I have seen you grow up in this house and now reach this particular milestone. We want to thank you for your faithfulness to our church, youth group, kids church, everything you've, you guys have done. And I just want to take a moment and just give you a few thoughts at this milestone in your life. So first of all, <clears throat> seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You determine your life goals through your visions, passions, leadings of the Lord. But in everything, put the Lord first. He's got the plan already determined, your spouse, your vocation, you know. But I want to say what's important in your next stage is what role you allow faith to have in your own life in determining the next phase. Trust Him to lead you from this point on. There might be a lot of questions. Some of you, you may know for sure. Some of you, there may be a lot of things up in the air but God has a plan for you. He will not hide his will or direction from your life. He will unveil it and unfold it. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean into your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and God will direct your paths. Don't let adversity discourage you. Don't quit in the midst of your dreams. God's path has mountains, valleys, curves, blind spots. There's times of great joy and times of great tears. Don't give up. Set your sights on your goals. Work hard. Pray hard. Do not give up. You cannot choose the difficulties that you face in life, but you can choose on how you respond to them in hard times. And Joseph was a great example of that. I also want to say have some fun in this next part of your life. And Roger Nemeth says, amen, okay? Because in a few years, the heavy weight of responsibility lays on your shoulders. There will be jobs, bills, mortgages, families, which are all wonderful. They are all wonderful, all right? But until that time, enjoy this next season. Jesus said, I come that you might have life and to enjoy it to the fullest. So enjoy the next few years. Embrace this moment. Have some fun. Skip class this fall on a sunny day. Just do it. Don't send your parents the link of this, please. You know, Bungee jump, hang glide, enter an all-you-can-eat chicken wing contest. Do just enjoy and savor this moment, okay, and this, this next season, all right? Also be thankful to your parents and for your parents. And I would like to ask the parents to come and stand behind, uh, stand behind each of these. The parents come. Would you give our parents a good hand this morning? <clears throat> I'm going to spread out just a little bit. <clears throat> so uh, this is an emotional time for them, okay? There's joy mixed in with tears. And, you know, you will never understand the sacrifice of the people that stand behind you until you have your own kids. You are an extension of what you have been taught and learned. They have cried, loved you, disciplined you, sacrificed for you. But most of all, at this moment, they are very proud of you, especially at this milestone uh, in your life. So now you kind of start cutting the cord of independence, and you already have been doing that. And it's a unique transition as they are releasing you but holding you and learning the tension and the balance in between that. We want to pray over them this morning. I want Brad and Melissa to come. Becky, would you come? I would like some of our GC young adults, our college ministry, if you would come as well as they kind of uh, have this transition uh, in, in mind to, uh, you know, uh, in college ministry. We want to pray. We want to pray over you. So, uh, Mom and Dad, if you'll just kind of lay your hands on your kids. Congregation, did this take you back? It's been a while, hadn't it? been a while. 
Would you pray for our, our uh, young adults, young, young people here at this pivotal moment in their life? So, Lord, we thank you for this milestone of graduation from high school. Lord, as parents and as a church family, <clears throat> Lord, we celebrate this moment with them. But, Lord, there's all kinds of uncertainty. Doors open, doors close, red lights, green lights. There's a lot of uncertainty in this next phase. But, Lord, you are faithful. Your hand is upon them. And we pray in this next, mo- in this next season of life there will be clarity of vocation, relationships. Lord, there's going to be clarity of schools and majors and, and job opportunities. We pray over them today. We ask the touch of the Lord upon them. We pray the favor of God. We release them as parents, Lord, into this next season, joyfully knowing that your hand is upon them. And we pray today as a church and as pastors and leaders here, we pray the blessing of the Lord. May it rest upon these today. And Lord, we pray this prayer over them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And we pray the blessing and the the hand of the Lord upon you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you give them a good hand this morning? We're proud of you. We're proud of you. We're proud of you. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Becky and I, we have a, we have a gift that we want to uh, share with you as well. And, uh, and then out in the foyer, take a moment, kind of look at their tables. They're going to kind of be out there for a few moments uh, after the service, and we want to just celebrate with them today. Any, any words that you have, uh, that would be great. Any scholarships you would like to provide, that would be even better. So uh, just want to mention, uh, mention that this morning. Uh, just a couple of things uh, today. Uh, in a moment, at the end of the service, we're going to do a uh, water baptism. And if you're here today and you'd like to be baptized and you didn't plan it, it's okay. We got it taken care of for you. So if you during worship or if you just, but man, I'd like to be baptized. You go to guest services. We've got towels. We've got T-shirts. We've got everything you need to know. Go tell someone, hey, I want to be baptized. We'll get you in the line this morning. So just wanted to mention that. Also, we are at the end of the service school year, all of the teachers say amen. Listen, we want to say thanks to all of our teachers, administrators, homeschool parents, professors for, uh, for the unbelievable sacrifice and investment you make into our students. And after service at guest services, we have a little Chick-fil-A card for you. So if you're a, a teacher, administrator, if you're one of our professors, I had professors this time because we have a good number. As long as you've been kind to your students during exams, you get a Chick-fil-A card. If you've been one of those professors that don't get good reviews, you know, I don't know. They, can, they, can, they review professors now. So we just want to say thanks to all those. Would you give them a hand? We're so, so honored today. And lastly, we did a food giveaway a few weeks ago. We have tons of pallets over here. They are free. So women, if you have been praying for a new pallet wall in your room, in your house, but there was just no pallets, God has provided for you over here. First come, first serve. Pick them up when you leave. Galatians chapter 5. Please, please turn there this morning. Galatians chapter 5. Uh, continuing. Uh, a series on called Good Fruit. Good Fruit. In this series, we are looking at the continued spiritual conflict with our flesh and the powerful working of the Holy Spirit that makes us like Jesus. We're in the fourth, uh, the fourth part of this series. So, and this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, feeds right into it. But today is Pentecost Sunday. 
So some of you may know what that is. Some of you, this may be kind of new, but Pentecost Sunday commemorates the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and the other followers of Jesus while they were celebrating the Feast of Weeks. So what happened 50 days after uh, the resurrection of Jesus, there were thousands of people that were, you know, that were in Jerusalem for this festival called Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. They called it later Pentecost because of the 50, it was 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. So they were in Jerusalem for this, for this festival spelled out in the book of Leviticus. It was the celebration of the spring harvest. So they were thankful the harvest was over. It was kind of a relief. You brought offerings to the Lord. All the hard work had been done. And now it was some time, now it was time to have some fun. So during this festival, when thousands of people are in Jerusalem, to, for this Old Testament festival, something unusual happened during this festival of Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. I want to read it. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and to begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Jesus had told them, there's going to be a time that I'm going to go away, but you're going to be better off because when I go away, the Holy Spirit is going to come. I'm sure that caused great confusion. They didn't understand that. But this is the moment that the Holy Spirit came, you know, to empower the church. And for 2,000 years, the Holy Spirit has been empowering the church and empowering uh, empowering believers. Now, this movement started very strong, and I want to encourage you, if you're new to what I'm talking about, read the book of Acts, and it will give you great explanations. So this movement started very strong, you know, uh, through the book of Acts and the, and, the de- and the centuries after that, very strong movement of the Holy Spirit, but slowly, you know, centuries later, it began to fade a little bit. You know, strange kind of doctrines and thoughts had woven themselves in. If you like to study, study Montanism. That was kind of one of the more formal ways that it was kind of straying from its biblical orthodoxy. And it just for a long period of time, it was just kind of, you know, just kind of weak. But there was always kind of a presence there. Then in 1906... In Azusa, uh, in Azusa Street in Los Angeles, California, the modern day outpouring of the Holy Spirit began again. William J. Seymour was teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This group of very poor people were filled with the Holy Spirit again, and it started what we know as the modern day. Pentecostal spirit-filled movement. If you see this picture up here that was taken right after that, William J. Seymour, what's interesting about this, he's the man sitting in the middle. He is African American. There are all kinds of different races. There are women that are included, and I think it's a wonderful picture of the church. This initial outpouring that started in Los Angeles, California, started working its way throughout the United States. The Assemblies of God was founded probably 12 years after that. And today, worldwide, the Pentecostal uh, charismatic Christianity, they number over 644 million adherents, okay? So this is not an infant movement this morning This or anymore. This is a powerful movement blowing across the world. Pentecostalism is believed to be the fastest growing religious movement in the world. Revival, unbelievable revival in Korea, okay? Most of the Christians in Korea are of spirit-filled background, and they are sending missionaries around the far east. There is a wonderful revival in Argentina and Brazil. Unbelievable outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Sub-Saharan Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, Botswana are experiencing unbelievable revival. Today. So, 
Pentecost Sunday is a reminder to us of the coming of the Holy Spirit to the church and a promise to believers today to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We believe what happened in Acts 2 to those believers in the church are still for you and I today. So this is not... This is not just a memorial. This is a fresh commissioning of the church for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And we are going to do that in the end. We say, welcome Holy Spirit. Do your work in our church and in our lives. So, as the book of Acts spells out the working of the Holy Spirit Uh, in the church uh, as far as spreading the gospel and evangelism, Galatians, and this all ties together, Galatians is the working of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of people to make sure that those spreading the gospel were like Jesus, okay? They were living like Jesus. So, So this is part of the series, Good Fruit. Galatians 5, and I want to read you this passage, Galatians 5 and verse 16. It's kind of been our, it's been our theme. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And he explains some of this here, Acts 19. So the acts of the flesh are obvious: sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So, in previous weeks, because this is, this is week four here, we are, we are born with a predisposition to sin and evil. It is first nature in our heart. The Bible calls this predisposition our flesh. You just saw it referenced. The Bible calls this predisposition our flesh. It's the internal desires and emotions operating directly opposite to the Holy Spirit. Once you become a Christian, you've now entered a spiritual conflict that never ends. That passage says the flesh is contrary to the Spirit. The Spirit is contrary to the flesh. I mean, there's, a, there's an internal battle the rest of your life as a believer. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So, I've been saying, you know, like apart from God working in our heart, these things are impossible to duplicate. You cannot just manufacture spiritual fruit. This is not an effort of of human will and just, you know, human determination. This is a fruit that is born by the Holy Spirit that is not a product of human will or human effort. As we are closer to Jesus, as we get served Jesus, the fruit of the Spirit just begins to emerge. We can be more conscious of it and realize that we have a need for it, But this fruit cannot be manufactured just by human determination. So this is is a fruit that's born by being close to Jesus. So in previous weeks, we've talked about love, joy, gentleness, patience. And today we're going to do kindness and self-control. So the fruit of the spirit of kindness, all right? Kindness, goodness of heart, gracious, pleasant, hospitality. Acts of kindness, readiness to help, benevolence, equipped for action. Kindness is the answer for an angry, hate-filled world. We live in an angry world. 
more violence than you've ever just seen in cities and on the sidewalks. People yelling, screaming, on, on edge. I mean, I've, I've never seen anything like it. We live in a world of anger, hate, retribution that leads to violence. This generation of politicians are the worst. They are name callers and mockers and they speak terribly about their opponents and they put that seed into our heart as well. TV news opinion shows are absolutely the worst. I stopped watching them because they drive you to hate and, and lead you to hate those that think differently than you. Social media influencers, some of them, are the worst. They will drive you to anger, to hate, to violence over certain topics. And listen, that is not what Jesus teaches. Kindness is the answer for an hang angry, hate-filled world. Jesus doesn't teach that, and let's don't fall for that. We do not hate people who believe differently on certain things than we do. We need kindness. Kindness is anti-Darwinian and places value on the powerless, hurting, broken, and those with needs. Darwin said the stronger will eventually overtake the weak. The gospel of Jesus is antithetical to that teaching. It places value on those that are struggling and hurting. It implores us not to just watch their demise or sit idly by, but be proactive in helping and serving those. So kindness is anti-Darwinian and places value on the powerless, the hurting, broken, and those with needs. Kindness lifts, encourages, and supports others. We live in a world that is beat down, under pressure, loaded with stress and trouble. People like that, and we all, we, we probably feel that way ourselves sometimes, but when you are in that situation, emotionally, you are on the edge. People are open to a kind act, a thoughtful deed, an uplifting word, and a smile. Kindness lifts, encourages, and supports others because there's power in kindness. As a follower of Jesus, I'm kind. As a follower of Jesus, I'm kind. I can be kind to others. And there's no limit on kindness. You don't have, you know, a kindness cap. Okay, well, I've done my kind acts for the week. I can move on. There is no limit to kindness. We can be kind to everyone. Be kind to your leaders. Be kind to your neighbors. Be kind to those that hurt you. Be kind to those that oppose you. Be kind to the powerful. Be kind to the powerless. I am kind because Jesus is kind, and that's part of my life as a follower of Jesus. Kindness has the power to make someone's day better. Kindness, kindness is life giving, okay? Sci kindness has the power to open the door to someone who's going through a hard time, and, and maybe there might be conversation. Kindness has the power to build up those that have been beaten down. Kindness can lift, encourage, and give hope to those that have no hope. Kindness can be a nonverbal way to communicate the love of Jesus and build a bridge to others. Sometimes when we talk about sharing our faith, like people get a little intimidated when it's, you know, like speaking and sharing their faith and talking. Well, you know what? Kindness is nonverbal, okay? But it also may help you to build a bridge to others at some point. Those, those kind acts and good deeds may one day earn you the right to share what God's done in your life, okay? So if you're like, I'm not really good sharing my faith, talking about the Lord, then you might be surprised kindness can open the door and build a bridge, and in the right time, you will, you know, you'll be able to, uh, to talk to them. Nonverbal acts 
are just as powerful because it shows in a tangible way our love for Christ and our concern for them. Kindness can be an answer to modern-day skepticism of Christianity. Okay, There's lots of people that think a lot of strange things. Many, Most of them are untrue Okay, about faith and about serving Jesus. And I'm, some people are even a little suspicious when you tell them you're a Christian, okay? Especially when you tell them you are a spirit-filled Christian, okay? So there's, sometimes there's the skepticism about us, okay? They, so they might be suspicious of our actions. They might debate our theology. They might question our beliefs, But if they're in need, they will appreciate the fact that you handed them a coffee and donut, okay? They they probably will say thank you, but in their mind, they will go, that's nice. That was nice. Why? Why did they do that? Of course, last week, we had the unfortunate storms, the tornadoes that came, came through our community. All were affected. Our church was able last Saturday to do a convoy of hope food distribution. We didn't do it under any pretense, but just to serve our community and just help. We had many, some of you were affected by the storm, many in this area. And let me tell you, man, there were two tornadoes north of us, one that was south of us. I mean, we're like, we were just very thankful that it didn't affect our, you know, our, our, uh, our church here, but as people were coming through the line, we didn't do this for any other reason, but as people were coming through the line, they were moved by kindness. They were just moved. I was on the radio with Becca and Abigail because I needed to keep the cars going, okay, keep this thing going. Well, my cars would not come. I would go, I need four cars. Nothing. You know why? Because people were pouring their hearts out to them. They were moved just by the simple fact that people would care enough to give a little food. They were opening their hearts to people. They were sharing hurts and fears. And so, Abigail and Becca, I want you to say, please forgive me, okay? Because I'm like, where are my cars? Where are my cars? Becca would be like, we're praying with people. We're talking to people. You know, <clears throat> because let me say, sometimes kindness opens a door when people are hurting. We didn't do it for any other reason but to serve, but the act of kindness, you know, just was moving people in, in, in different ways. And when they came through our line, we didn't care if they were Christian, atheist, or Muslim. We were surprised at the number of Muslim families that came through. There is a community of people from Afghanistan that live here in Syria. We were surprised that they would come through the line of a a Christian church. But when you don't have any food or you, you are at risk, we were surprised. So it didn't matter to us, you know, uh, Christian, atheist, Muslim, gay, straight, saint or sinner, it didn't matter. It didn't matter because, you know, we wanted to do something, you know, for our community there, but I'm just going, many people are moved by random acts of kindness. Kindness is given with no strings attached, okay? Don't be kind to just those that might possibly be able to help you later on. We are not trying to build kindness credits. There is no such thing, okay? We just are kind, okay? We're, we're, we're not trying to manipulate others with kindness, okay? When we do a kind act, it's not necessarily that they have to come to church here when you do a kind act. Sometimes that happens. They're moved, but we don't do something to get them back, we just serve Jesus with kindness. Be kind and generous. Whatever you give, God will repay. Sometimes kindness costs money. 
Sometimes kindness costs money. And I just say to you, don't worry about the money. Just be kind. Be generous in the moment. Whatever you give out, God will give back. If you've got a heart of kindness and generosity, and God puts something in your hand, and you give it out over here, and you've got a kind and generous heart, He's not going to re- not replenish that because kindness and generosity are what we do. So when you take something from your account and you give it out, you can just bet God's going to pay that back. So don't go, that was $35. What am I going to do for lunch next week? I promise you, just be kind. Whatever you give out, God will replace. Now, everyone got a little card, okay? It's a kindness card, act of kindness, all right? Just to kind of remind you this week, if you did not get one, I've got several here. They are, they've got them at guest services. So this week, I want this card to just be a reminder. Somewhere this week, I want you to do an act of kindness somewhere, okay? I want you to find some, something and do something nice for someone, just kind, cookies and donuts, take them to work, pay for someone's fast food meal behind you in a drive through which I've done, but make sure it's not a uh, family van behind you. It could cost you more money than you plan. Could be $47, and, uh, but whatever, God will repay. Okay, so... Send a note of encouragement to someone. Give another driver your parking lot. Make or send a meal to someone. Leave a big tip for a waiter or a waitress or delivery person that may be having a tough time. Pay for someone's meal at a restaurant. Give someone randomly a gift card for someone in need. Invite an elderly person sitting alone at a restaurant to join you. Help a foster care family. Pay for someone's mega sports camp or summer camp. Send groceries to someone in need. Send care packages to college students. All the college students say, I knew it. I knew that. I knew that. They'll be all looking poor after church. So, uh, you know, call an elderly person just to say hello. Hold the door for someone. Bring your neighbor's elderly or single mom's trash can in from the road. Prepare and hand out food and toiletry bags for the homeless. Help a stranded lady on the side of the road. Listen, this world is open to acts of kindness. Let's just don't drive by and be unconcerned. This world needs the kindness of Jesus that leads to the fullness of the gospel in their lives. But let me say, kindness doesn't come naturally because there's a Darwinian part of our heart that's just like, I got to take care of myself i got to take care of my, my, my own life. But I want to remind you, kindness is a spiritual fruit, all right? Especially when it involves money, all right? Some of that, that will be a miracle for some of you, all right? So kindness is a spiritual fruit. Colossians 3, therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Okay, so if kindness is not part of your life. We're going to pray God is going to work in a fresh way in our lives when it comes to kindness. The next, fruit of the Spirit, self-control. Self-control. Self-control is the restraint of natural impulses, the mastering of personal desires and passions, restraint or discipline exercised over one's behavior. Proverbs uses uh, the imagery of a walled city, kind of like a fort, okay? So this is what Proverbs 25 says. So just think of a walled city, you know, as a fort. Proverbs 25 and 28. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person that lacks self-control, okay? Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. There's no restraint anywhere. When the walls are down, there is no restraint and there is no protection either. Self-control is the wall that keeps me from harm. Self-control is the wall 
that keeps me from harm. So let me give you some applications <clears throat> of self-control, all right? Self-control and sexuality. Self-control and sexuality. When I was in high school, I had a dog, the only animal I ever owned in my life. His name was Bama. I felt like God gave me that name for my pet, okay? It became clear at some point that Bama had been a bad boy, and he had fathered two litters of puppies by two different dogs at about the same time, okay? I was very disappointed because we had raised him as a Christian dog in our home, okay? So, <clears throat> but animals in that area have no self-control. That is why they are spayed and neutered, and Bob Barker would be very happy that I even mentioned that to you this morning, okay? But to the Christian, we are not animals. We are Christians with the Holy Spirit working in our heart to give us strength and self-control in this area, okay? So a common thought about sexual sins are, are that these feelings, urges, and passions are impossible to control. They're impossible. Or a lot of day, modern day science will tell you it's unhealthy to repress sexual urges and passions, all right? And both of those are wrong. It is not unhealthy, and they can be controlled, all right? But, but here's, here's what happens to many. You live your whole life with very little sexual restraint, and then you, you, know, you come to, to faith, and the way you kind of dealt with sexual passion was there was, there was no walls, there were, there were no restraints, and man, the way you deal with that, it's been already kind of set in stone in your emotions and your psychology, and now, man, you come when you've lived unrestrained, and the Bible says, no, you can control this. You can control this, all right? You're ruled or governed by your passions. And I want to say, too, if there's no self-control in this area, it will lead you to pornography and sexual sins, okay? It will lead you when there's no, no self-control in this area. 1 Thessalonians 4 says this. It's very interesting. The wording is very interesting. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. That each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. So we're followers of Jesus with the Holy Spirit working in our hearts to give us strength and self-control over carnal sexual urges and passions. Now let me say again, this is not something you necessarily fight on your own. This is not just about will and determination. Okay, this is a spiritual fruit. The Holy Spirit will help you in this area. You are not helpless in this area. I don't care what your therapist tells you. Okay, the Lord can help you bring restraint and self control, and you can live in this area holy and honorable before God. Self control and money. Oh, we're going to have revival this morning. It is Pentecost Sunday, okay? A person controlled by money will have serious spiritual and financial consequences. This is not a joke or a game, okay? When, when there's no self-control in the area of your finances, it will bring ruin upon your life and your family's life, and it will drag you down spiritually, some of you get the shakes when you go into the store. I just got to spend. I got to spend. And now you don't even have to go into a store. You just get on Amazon.com and you just start sweating. You just start, you know, you start perspiring, okay? It's the desire for something that you cannot afford or don't really need. Covetousness, impatience, greed, and selfishness without restraint will drive you into a debt that it will be difficult for you to recover from, okay? Impulse buying. I have to have it now. 
I got to have it now. All right? And that's where online retail shopping is not our favor. We don't have to even go out. We can just sit there and impulse buy. And then let me ask you this. You get it sometimes and you don't even like it. Nobody will say amen because you will not admit that you've done it. All right? Impulse buying, self-image, self-esteem purchases. Sometimes we make unwise purchases because we're hurting or we don't feel good about ourselves. If I just had this, if I, I, if I had this clothing item, if I had this, it would just make me feel better about myself. And I just want you to know it is masking something deeper. And you can drive yourself into debt trying to purchase something that will make you feel better about your situations. And then when we're facing this without, with little self-control, there are credit and credit cards that empower us to act in this situation that will drive our debt even worse. So when it comes to money and finances, we need the Holy Spirit's help and self-control. Listen to me. This is not a financial issue per se that you need Dave Ramsey, okay? This is a spiritual issue that you need the fruit of the Holy Spirit and self-control to help you. Self-control can keep us from unwise or unhealthy spending. Self-control can provide the patience so that my purchases are well thought out and in line with my present budget. So when I've got self-control and I take a deep breath, I'm able to evaluate this purchase. Is it something that I really need? Is it something that I can afford in line with my present budget? And sometimes self-control will say no. And that's good. Or sometimes self-control will say, not now, maybe a little bit later. But I'm just telling you, if we we have financial issues and there's no self-control in this area, we will work ourselves into a debt that we will not be able to recover. But this is a fruit of the Spirit. Got it? Got it? So this is a thing that we need the Lord's help in the area of, of money. Some need the help in this area. You need the, the strength and the discipline of the Lord. Worship team, you can come. Self-control in my temper. Self-control in my temper. Have any of you ever heard the term uh, microaggressions? Any of your bosses, human resources ever talked to you about that? Because there are great sensitivities today toward, you know, uh, outburst and how we how we treat people. Now, let me say too, anger is sometimes justified. Sometimes it is. Okay, sometimes there are legitimate things that happen in our life that cause us to be upset. Okay, so it's not always wrong. Sometimes people have a quick trigger and everything. You know, they have issues with their you know with their temper, harsh words, harsh tone, loud volume. Sometimes. Even when anger is justified, the overreaction of that is not. Even when there's a legitimate reason to be upset, you know, just harming people, deep hurt, uncontrolled temper, you know, uncontrolled words, and sometimes this leads to violence as well. And we need the help from the Lord. Self-control can allow me the time to cool off and respond by saying the right thing at the right time. So when I'm angry and I need to deal with something, I'm not asking you to suppress your anger. What I'm saying is let self-control pull you back, take a deep breath, and you think through your response. Even when you're legitimately angry, you can say it, you can, your, your words and your tone can honor God, speak the truth, and is constructive to building and continuing the relationship. The opposite happens. We don't honor God. We tear down relationships and reckless words cut like a sword. But we can say what honors God. We can speak the truth. And we can say what is constructive to continuing the relationship. Last, self-control in my tongue. I'm only going to spend a moment on this. Some are very thankful, okay? Gossip, 
unrestrained conversation about other people, rumors, things that are not confirmed as being, uh, being true, saying things about issues in people's lives that we have no idea whether they're truth or not. And sometimes even when it's truthful, I have no business speaking it. Okay? Intentionally discussing or revealing information about a person in a negative light. It might be true, but does it, does it help? Does it help? And some people even enjoy talking about the misery of other people. For some reason, it makes them kind of feel better about their, their own life, okay? So, let's remember this. I don't have to speak everything that I think. They're going to put that on the screen. All right, pop that up there. There you go. I don't have to speak everything that I think. Would you repeat that with me? I don't have to speak everything that I think. I just feel like this side needs to say that one more time. I don't have to speak everything that I think, okay? So self-control, self-control says, hey, there may be like for whatever reason, I'm wanting to talk about this, but I don't have to do this. Self-control can keep me from gossip, rumors, and from conversations that hurt others and my testimony as a follower of Jesus, okay? So we need, we need, man, you'd think, man, self-control is not that important. Self-control is huge when it comes to our testimony. Again, you can't just by human will and determination, I'm going to be a little better in this area. This is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. This comes from the depth of our relationship, the Holy Spirit bearing fruit that can help us in this area. Would you stand with me this morning? We're going to do baptisms in just, just a moment. But I want to take a moment and I just want to pray. Today's Pentecost Sunday. We're just going to take a moment and we're just going to pray for the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to be in our lives. And then we're just going to take a moment and we're going to pray for the fruit of kindness and, and uh, self-control this morning. Brent, go ahead and let's just sing that. Come on, let's, let's worship for a moment as we prepare for baptism. Holy Spirit, make me more like Jesus. Come on, sing it. Every day a little more like Jesus. Crucify my flesh with yours, that my new life might be secure. Everything I do, Lord, is done so I can honor you. Resurrect me, sanctify me, make me more like Come on, sing it. Make that Every a prayer day this morning. A more like Jesus. Crucify my flesh with yours. That my new life might be secure. Everything I do, Lord, turn so I can honor you. Resurrect me, sanctify me. Make me more like you. Holy Spirit, make me more like Jesus. Every day a little more. My new life might be secure. Everything I do, Lord, turn to I can honor you. Come on, sing it. Resurrect me, sanctify me, make me into your image. So oh God, thank you, Lord. Make me more like you, Jesus. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So let's let's pray this prayer of Pentecost and for these fruits. So, Lord, 2,000 years ago, Lord, you blessed the church by sending the Holy Spirit upon believers. And we are thankful. And we are the recipients of that act in the upper room on that day. We thank you for new life. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that is our comforter, our convictor, our guide, our spirit baptizer. And this morning as a church and believers, we ask you again to pour your spirit out upon the church. 
Lord, we need your power. We need your presence, Lord. We need the filling of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to spread the gospel and to be the church. So we pray today for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with your presence, Lord. Baptize us today in the Holy Spirit as you did in Acts chapter 2. Lord, we pray that you would empower us to spread the gospel, to live out our faith boldly. Lord, we pray for renewal and revival and awakening, Lord, in the church and in the hearts of people. Pour your spirit out upon us. Lord, we pray the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let them emerge from your church. Help us to use them for your glory and the good of others. Lord, we pray for the fruit of the Holy Spirit. As we are doing ministry, Lord, let us be like Jesus. Lord, let us reflect you in character and in personality. Lord, pour your spirit out upon us. Would you take a moment just in your own way and say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Refresh me with the Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, we need your power. We need your presence. Lord, fall upon us again. Holy Spirit, we need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. Now, Lord, we pray. We pray this morning for the fruit of kindness. Lord, if it it's not a manufactured human emotion. It is a fruit of the Spirit. And, Lord, we pray in this area, Lord, that as we're aware that we'll be just more kind, more considerate, more compassionate, more generous. Lord, it's the opposite. It's the opposite of so many things in our culture today. And we pray for the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Lord, we pray for the fruit of self-control. You don't want us to be like a city with no walls. Self-control provides the barrier and protection that we need. We pray, especially in the area of sexuality, money, temper, and tongue. Lord, let the fruit of the Holy Spirit, let this that let, let these walls guide and protect us. We pray actively, Lord. We pray actively, Lord, for the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life. And we give you praise today. We give you praise today. Thank you, Lord. Brent, lead us again in that. We're preparing for baptism this morning. There's a time and a season for all things, right? And he's going to do something new in us. We celebrated graduates earlier. We get to celebrate new life now. And so, everybody, this is Josiah. I have the luxury and privilege to baptize him and his sister. You go ahead and be seated. So, there's something special happening in our student ministry right now. I can't make sense of it. I don't know what what it is exactly other than that God is moving in the hearts and in the lives of our students. Man, we've, we, with Josiah and Yanis, we will have baptized like 10 students in the last six months. That's special. And I make mention to that because Josiah here, we asked him why he wanted to be baptized. And he said, man, I've just, over the last couple of months, I've just really started to take my faith more seriously. I've been reading my Bible, I've been listening to worship music, and now is the time. And so I have the privilege to baptize Josiah. Josiah, you believe that Jesus died for you and rose again uh, so that you could spend eternity with him. Yes. 
and you promise to spend the rest of your day serving him. Yes. All right, let's baptize you. He's ready to be baptized. It's a self-baptism. Josiah, because of your profession of faith and because of your desire to live for Jesus all the days of your life, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is Yanis Cervantes. This is Josiah's younger sister. I won't say little sister, right? It's younger sister. So this is a proud day for mom and dad. Uh, maybe one of the proudest, if I had to say so myself. And uh, man, we asked Yanis why she wanted to be baptized. And uh, just a little while ago, maybe within the last couple of months, Yanis said, I just, I feel called to be in worship ministry. And uh, she said, before I feel like I can step into that, I've got to make a decision that I'm going to walk with him forever. And so now is the time to be baptized. And so, Yanis, you believe that Jesus died for you and rose again so you can spend eternity with him? Yes. And you promise to live for him all the days of your life? Yes. All right, let's baptize you. Yanis, because of your profession of faith and your desire to live for Jesus all the days of your life, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These next baptisms are very special to me. This is Joy and Josiah Strickland. And uh, many of you know Miss Linda. She's been in this church a long time and a really cool moment for me because Miss Linda was my Sunday school teacher as a child. And uh, so her investment into me uh, obviously has made a huge impact on my life. And so to have the honor to be part of these two baptisms, is, it just means the world. And uh, Joy, I asked her, Joy, why do you want to be baptized? And she said, well, I've accepted Jesus like a thousand times. So, <laughs> and I said, well, it sounds like you're ready then. <laughs> but uh, both of these guys, Joy and Josiah, they both said that they've been made new because of Jesus and they want their church family to know uh, that, that they are new creations because of him and they want you to know that they've decided to follow Jesus. And so uh, we're going to baptize both of them today. We'll start with, uh, let's go ladies first. Jo uh, Joy, hop on in. Joy, because of your faith in Jesus and your desire to be a follower of him, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is my buddy Josiah. I love Josiah. I love both of these. Now, anytime you see Josiah, normally he's got a donut in his hand. All right? All right? Now, he's not going to share with you his donut, but he will go get you another one because he's a servant, but he won't share. No, I'm, I'm excited for this whole family. Linda, long-time investment. You've seen the fruit, the fruit of that. Let's baptize Josiah. 
Josiah, because of your faith in Jesus Christ and your desire to be a follower of him, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So this baptism is very special. All of them are. This is Aaron Rojas, and he's been just at our church a few months. If you remember, a few months ago, we did an outreach called Springtime Tallahassee. You remember that? We had the tent up, just kind of marketplace ministry, just kind of out there in the community, getting your, getting your name out, meeting people. Uh, I was there for the last hour to kind of help them kind of pack up, and Aaron came up to the booth and talked to our team and got information about the church and Aaron was in church the very next day and over the last few weeks Aaron has given his life over to Jesus <clears throat> and just said he just felt like he needed a change in his life some of you just need to change you know where you're going what you're feeling is not you're not headed in a good place and you need a change and Aaron found that change through the person of Jesus and I want to say too to our church we spend a lot of money on outreaches and evangelistic things but we you never know when you plant a seed that's going to bear fruit here and this is one of the seed of that of that outreach that day so Aaron first of all for those that, that don't know, we're glad that you are at our church, and we're very excited for what the Lord has, is doing in your life. So, <clears throat> Aaron, before God, <clears throat> this congregation, you want to let everyone know that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. He's forgiven your sins, and you're ready to make a public confession of your faith to Jesus. And the rest of your life, you want to follow Jesus. Yes, I do. Let's baptize. This is a great baptism right here. Yeah, oh no, I got you, I got you. We, we, got a, we got a coach different in this meeting, so. Aaron, because of your faith in Jesus and your desire to be a follower of him, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This morning, so Lord, we give you praise this morning. God, we thank you for all that you're doing in us. God, we thank you for all the lives that are being changed. God, the lives that have surrendered to you and that celebrate new life in you today. God, I pray over our graduates again, Lord. I pray that you would bless them. Lord, be with each of us as we go. See what you've done today in our hearts. God, and we leave here today rejoiceful that you are drawing us close to you, Lord. We give you praise this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church shouted, Hey, you are dismissed. Make sure you check out our graduates out there and say hello. Encourage them with a kind word and uh, be blessed this week. We'll see you next Sunday.